Welcome back. Today I'm going to talk about C3 AI, a recent IPO in a similar space as Palantir. In this video, I'll share an overview on the company, analyze their current situation, discuss their relation to PLTR, and share some clips featuring Tom Siebel, founder, chairman, and CEO of this artificial intelligence software platform and applications company. Let's go. Overview. This company was founded by Tom Siebel, who has won a number of awards for his skills as an entrepreneur and basically invented the category of customer relations management, one of the key pillars of enterprise software. C3 AI shares started trading in the public market on December 9th, 2020. The company is focused on providing tools allowing large enterprises to build unique and sophisticated applications based on the use of artificial intelligence technology. Currently, the high valuation is reflective of optimism about one massive contract that is the company's main business opportunity, an arrangement with Baker Hughes under the ticker BKR. C3 AI is a hyper-growth company, but more recently, some of that growth has stalled out. This company provides enterprise-grade AI software using a software-as-a-service consumption model. Essentially, this company has a comprehensive platform that includes application development tools and a runtime environment. In addition to the platform, this company offers turnkey applications that address specific industry verticals. The company describes its tools as those that provide access to data without data science training to rapidly perform data science tasks. Analysis In its latest fiscal year, the top three customers accounted for 44% of total revenues. Obviously, this introduces extreme volatility for revenue performance, having such a highly concentrated source of revenue coming from Baker Hughes. But the total addressable market for what the company provides is substantial, which means there is a lot of potential runway from here. The company will have the opportunity to achieve insane growth for many years to come, since C3's total addressable market is supposed to reach $44 billion by 2024, and this is more than large enough to support some high growth aspirations for this company. The arrangement with BKR requires Baker Hughes to purchase an additional $403 million of software from C3 over the next four years. At this point, it has already purchased $47 million. So this is a very large contract in the enterprise software space. With the current annualized revenue run rate for C3 of just $165 million, Baker Hughes has made a strong commitment based upon experiential use. So, as with Palantir, investors may be considering C3 not for their current revenue multiples, but for its contract with a major enterprise that is enormous relative to the current size of the company. Circling back to C3's purpose, AI is something that will benefit just about every large enterprise established today. The AI opportunity in the enterprise is really one of the largest opportunities in enterprise software at this time, and this company has lots of first mover advantages. Baker Hughes is both a customer and a reseller. It has an exclusive right to resell the AI solution within the oil and gas industry. Baker Hughes has agreed to sell a $39.5 million per year license agreement for its internal use covering the next three years. And you'll recall that Palantir averages a contract length of just over three years, so it's, it appears that is overlapping a little bit here. And the agreement was just recently extended and increased with minimum total revenue commitments, which are now $53 million in the current fiscal year. This ends April 30th to $150 million by the fiscal year 2024. That $150 million minimum commitment is obviously an exceptional contractual commitment and is clearly what has excited investors up to this point. And just for full disclosure, Baker Hughes is also a venture shareholder in C3AI. Palantir. Most investors know about a company's competitive moat. C3 makes the case that it offers users a unique end-to-end -end solution, which includes the design, the development, the provisioning, and the operation of enterprise AI solutions at scale. The C3 AI S1 says that the company has no competitors other than the internally developed applications that incorporate AI, but I can think of those like IBM as indirect competitors. Although, C3 provides the completeness and scalability of a solution, something that should sound familiar to what Palantir aims to provide to its corporate and government clients. Just as a first impression, I think Palantir and C3 have the same ethos when it comes to building platforms for problem solving. But then again, 
Palantir has its government side, while C3 is more or less strictly defining itself as an enterprise provider. That leaves more room for Palantir to run in my opinion. Regardless, I think we need to wait and see how they compete, if at all, with clients in the corporate space, a place I hope Palantir drastically expands in the near future. I've cut together the following clips. They span a wide variety of topics, but I think hearing from any executives of a company is quite important before making a judgment on the business. I'll be back after for some closing thoughts. You know, the markets are, the markets will do what the market will do. I think this is, this is a financing event uh, for C3 to enable us to meet the needs of, um, you know, rapidly expanding demand for what we do. Uh, you know, it's good that the markets are open again, and uh, we're very pleased to be able to participate. I think this is a, is a great testament to the work that the employees of C3 have done in the last decade, and now we're ready to expand this business at global scale. How, how is this different from late 90s, early 2000s? Are, are there any uh, warning flags or signals that uh, you're at least, uh, that you at least are thinking about thinking about? Well, I think there's no similarity, really. I mean, if you think about Oracle, Oracle went public in 1986 off of trailing revenues of $12 million. Siebel Systems went public in 1996 off of trailing revenues of, I think, $8 million. Today, we see companies going <laughs> off, you know, where trailing revenues are an order of magnitude larger than that. So it's, a, it's an entirely different game. And these companies are generating cash. These are companies like C3.ai that I believe is a structurally profitable, structurally cash positive business. You know, we, we didn't have the activity of, you know, monetary policy like we do today that uh, clearly changes everything. Something else that we spent a lot of time talking about this year that's been different is sort of the role of the younger retail so-called Robin Hood investor that are very interested in next generation technologies like artificial intelligence. Um, how do you see them playing into the value proposition, sort of the share price going forward? You know, it's a phenomenon. It's a great question, Deirdre. It's a phenomenon that I don't understand this new kind of COVID retail market. Um, I, I hope these people are being careful and I hope they're being cautious and I hope they don't get hurt. Tom, how do you see that broader, you know, AI race between the U.S. and China? You've been, you know, hugely successful since your IPO and attracting investor attention, but you know, as I've reported in the past, there's a lot more startups focusing on artificial intelligence in China. So where do you think uh, sort of the playing field is right now? Who's in the lead? Well, uh, I think China is investing tens of billions uh, in this in a very well organized um, fashion coming from the NRDC down. And they're very serious. And as Vladimir Putin said, in I think September of 2017, uh, you know, whoever wins the, the the, the war on AI dominates the world. I believe that's true, and it, it will not be Russia. So uh, I think this is very critical. I think we need to take it very seriously. I, uh, we have some very bright people in Washington, D.C. doing this, but I think it needs to be um, a more organized and especially um, you know, mobilize the private sector as we do so well uh, in, in Western economies. Uh, to address this opportunity. But if we lose this war on AI, we uh, the story will not end well. But, uh, you know, energy security and climate security are very important issues, and these are very natural applications of AI. So you can see the work that, we're, that we are doing with um, uh, at the C3 AI Digital Transformation Institute with Microsoft, MIT, Berkeley, Princeton, Carnegie Mellon, University of Chicago, and Stanford, uh, that the next call for papers is going to be about applying AI and digital transformation to uh, energy security and climate security. So I think this is a natural application of AI where we can have a huge impact on safer energy, cleaner energy, more renewable energy, using AI for carbon sequestration, what have you. So yes, I think there is a very large opportunity there. What is it that you at C3 AI are bringing ingredient-wise to this that's going to be hard for others to match? Well, what we're doing at C3 AI with Microsoft and Adobe is creating the next generation we have created, the next generation of CRM basically through innovation. And what's going on at Salesforce today, and I think it's a fine company, they've done a great job uh, with the CRM market, but they've been growing 
really not through innovation, but through acquisition, you know, through these, uh, you know, MuleSoft or whatever these things that they're buying all the time. So they've been going through acquisition. And I think if we look at the underlying technology of, of Salesforce and Force.com, it might be kind of 2002, 2003 technology. So it's a couple decades out of date. But when we combine, you know, the marketing reach of Adobe and Microsoft, I mean, this would be, you know, this is an order of magnitude larger market reach, an order of magnitude larger revenue than, than Salesforce. So I think that you know, we have a very credible offering and I suspect that um, I wouldn't be surprised if we uh, don't establish a leadership position in this new generation of CRM, which is all about artificial intelligence. Conclusion. C3 use cases include anything from banking to energy supply. The bull case here is, of course, that C3 becomes a large and successful company with many contracts bringing in enormous sums of revenue. AI is one of the foundational technologies that will usher in the digital transformed era. It is and will continue to be a major competitive tool. I currently hold no position, but I'm open to buying a few shares in the future, considering how the stock has cooled off more recently. Although, I would urge anyone looking to invest to dive more deeply into the fundamentals. If that's something you want to see me do, drop a like and leave a comment. As for now, I think today's valuation is reflective of a great future success ahead of it, which is, of course, not guaranteed. That being said, many have made such an argument about Palantir, but I believe the story and growth on that one is strong enough to hold it and keep it pushing higher. Check out my PLTR playlist if you want to hear more of my thoughts there. Until next time.